Hi and welcome to the Ericsson 2018 OSS BSS user group in New York. I'm Des Blanchfield and I have the pleasure of being joined by Paul McCluskey from Ericsson. Hi Paul, how are you? Hi Des, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for joining me. So um, there's a lot of exciting things that have come out uh, from you and your team and so forth around Cenex and Cenex acquisition with Ericsson and so forth and how that relationship is going to fold out, uh, which I'd love to delve into. Before we do, a uh, couple of amazing days here in New York. Uh, I heard a number of something in the order of like 60 odd uh, different operators under the same roof all learning how to work together. Uh, some amazing content, some incredible SMEs talking about what's happening behind the, the, the uh, scenes and so forth. Your general sense of a couple of days, what are the big things for you that you're seeing around the place? I mean, we've got 5G emergence, we've got software defined everything, NFE, SDN, uh, cybersecurity. Really keen to get what your personal take on these couple of days is and, and I guess what your takeaways are. Yeah, uh, I think there was a good presentation uh, by Verizon this morning. Um, that was very interesting talking about partnering and how important that mm -hmm. is and the extra infrastructure and uh, um, standards and you know, all those other things are required to make that uh, work more seamlessly. Uh, one theme that is sort of recurring everywhere you go though is automation and complexity and scale are really driving that discussion I think. So solving the problem of, of, of the complexity of not just the, the IT environment but all of the operations environments too, uh, that seems to be something everyone's trying to figure out how, they're gonna, how are they going to do that for 5G, how are they going to do that for NFV. Um, so that's a, that's definitely a recurring theme around the place. Yeah, I get the the from all of that. One of the things I, I watching the same uh, content, it was like openness, interconnectivity, yeah. handoff. You know, all of a sudden it was this is such a big emerging market. It's moving so quickly that no one operator could do it all by themselves, and then they were playing on each other's strengths. And I think it's an exciting time because you know. A lot of the operators historically might have thought about vendor lock and you know let's control it all and choke it. Now it's like let's let's find as many friends as we can to get the biggest possible footprint. Yeah. And we can't all do it ourselves. Um, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, now the big question, uh, Cenex. Um, I'd like to get a couple things. So, firstly, you know what Cenex is for folk who are watching. You've probably heard about it, but don't fully understand it. What is it? What does it do? Where does it fit in the ecosystem? And I guess you know what the journey's been like with regard to the Ericsson relationship and the acquisition. Maybe uh, just uh, start with what Cenex is and what it provides, and then maybe some details on okay. the acquisition and Very what good. that journey's been like. Okay, good. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Cenex has been around uh, since uh, 2009 originally, mm -hmm. and uh, what we do is we're a, a next generation service assurance company. Um, and we're really trying to um, use topology, uh, real-time topology, as a basis for how we do some of the correlation of all the masses of data that we collect from the networks now. Right. So obviously there's all of the existing physical infrastructure that's out there, uh, but now we also have all of the virtualized uh, environments as well. So things get a little bit more complicated as the network's kind of moving around in real time. So we still have to collect all of that data and correlate yeah. it. Um, so that's, uh, that's our bread and butter, if you like. Uh, being able to make sense of uh, data that we're gathering from all those different places and then be able to identify problems uh, as quickly as possible, uh, find the root cause um, and then be able to trigger some kind of a healing action, uh, uh, hopefully in an automatic fashion yeah, so that yeah. the, the network can essentially fix itself. The, um, the self-healing network thing I think is going to be so critical because we've seen a big drive now around Ericsson's own digital transformation, the cloudification of their whole infrastructure and platform, software-defined networking, network function virtualization, et cetera, the, the business support systems, orchestration support systems. Bringing the intelligence to that now is going to, I think, makes it even more possible to do self-healing networks and you know, not just routing around broken things, but actually helping repair the broken things, particularly if it's software-defined because you can just re-instantiate the environment if it gets upset, right? Yes, yeah, so the world's changed. So it used to be, you know, when the, you identified a problem, then you identified the person that was going to go and change the card right. or replace the equipment. Unplug it, um, replug it, and reboot it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Whereas now we can actually uh, restart it or recreate it or make it bigger or smaller, you know, scale it in and out. Um, and all of those operations can be handled, uh, you know, in, in a lights out um, yeah. in fashion, which is which is a, a real opportunity in terms of operational savings. So I think that was certainly in Ericsson's mind mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of acquiring Scenix. Um, but also, I think in our customers' minds as they start to scale uh, their own NFV operations. Yep. But they're also still having to manage all of that infrastructure that they've spent the last, you know, 30 years acquiring. So well, it's a heady challenge, isn't it? Because you know, almost every well, all operators have a sunk cost of some form. Yes. Most of us are sort of five to 15 year R ROI. Uh, they're, they're protecting that because they've got a large investment into that that they've got to get a return on and keep operating. But they've also got to put another foot in the camp of this yeah. whole digital transformation and whatnot. And I really like the fact that Ericsson went through this journey as their own customer. I mean, I, I watched this thing evolve and I realized that Ericsson treated themselves as their own first customer. So if they weren't happy with it, they didn't expect clients to be happy with it. 
The acquisition journey, I'd really love to get your insights into that. I mean, it looked like a very seamless, uh, a happy uh, marriage of, of two <laughs> perfect combinations. Um, and it brings a lot of very amazing, powerful value into that relationship. Walk us through the acquisition journey. I guess the thing I'm yeah. really keen to, to have viewers understand is you know, where, where the value chain gets added to, you know, so Ericsson's got its own capabilities, I've always had logging and building and transactions, analytics at the traditional, I guess, telco space. But you're now talking about a whole range and a whole new gamut of things that they, they yeah. either weren't ready to do yet or didn't necessarily want to invest in. Uh, the acquisition piece first, just walk us through some of the highlights that, that, sure. that went under play there. So uh, our relationship with Ericsson goes back a few years and uh, we initially started with the managed services teams and what we did there was uh, deploy into the, the NOC environment to help uh, Ericsson uh, really reduce the time it takes to identify the root cause of a problem. Right. So we first had to prove ourselves uh, and uh, show that we could actually make a difference in an environment that already ran pretty efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that we could make a difference there I think was, was compelling for, for Ericsson. Um, so that was one piece, so the managed services component. I think uh, the second piece is really uh, more the Ericsson portfolio and I think what we're seeing in the industry is uh, operators are moving now then into the next phase of NFV, right? Okay. So, so they figured out how to fulfill it, they figured out yeah. how to get the VNFs out there, uh, but now you have to monitor it, now you have to operationalize it. And that's really the, the gap that we fill in okay. Ericsson's portfolio. So we're really now the, the trigger mechanism, if you like, for those closed loops and the yep. enabler for this uh, this automation process. So that's quite exciting for us to be a part of a, a much bigger value proposition. Indeed, yeah, I mean, I, I see it as a match made in heaven because it was a requirement uh, that at some point Ericsson is gonna have. It just seems to make sense from Senex's point of view that you could operate at the scale and you can now focus on sort of building those tools and models and analytics. One of the things that really strikes me is that shift from historical analytics to, I guess, stream in real time to predictive. Um, you yeah. talk about self-healing networks, you talk about finding issues in the infrastructure and being able to report on it or alert on it. Um, there's an interesting cultural and behavioral shift in that process in my experience. Uh, what does that look like in your world and some of the customers you're working yeah. with? And I guess particularly in the context of the Ericsson relationship now with the acquisition where you've got a much broader market to reach an audience. Uh, Historical, real-time, predictive, I mean, what does it even look like when you get asked to enter a boardroom with a whiteboard marker and perform <laughs> Jedi mind tricks? How do you, how do you just describe that transition from historical to real-time to predictive and, and what does that even look like in the real world? There was actually a good uh, presentation uh, earlier this afternoon which talked a little bit about the journey to sort of closed-loop automation, uh, right. Nirvana, if you like. Um, and the, the predictive analytics piece is, is one step along that journey. So the, the first thing is, you know, being able to orchestrate the infrastructure to mm -hmm. begin with. Mm -hmm. The second is really to, to sort of monitor what's there and to start to um, automate some of the basic uh, repair processes, yep. Yep. if you like. Um, really, w you have to get to that level first to sort of understand and, and gather enough information about how everything works yep. so that you have a baseline of data to work from to, to be able to predict the future. As it were. Right, right. Um, but for us, I think we're quite fortunate in that you know, we were a small company, and obviously that gives you a, a, a finite amount of resources mm -hmm. to work with for R&D, for example. Whereas now we're already starting to leverage uh, the innovation and, and, and the R&D capability that's you know accessible to us as part of Ericsson uh, to see how we can deploy some of the other things already working on um, directly into the product that we've already built. So okay. you know, focusing on the strengths that we already yeah, have, yeah. Uh, but then sort of building in some of those extra capabilities. So I think what you'll see is analytics will feature very heavily in our roadmaps going forward over the next you know, 12, 18 months, most likely. Indeed, and that leads me to my next question around, I guess, data-driven driven, decision-making. You know, we've seen this in enterprise around you know, banking, wealth management, finance, and so forth, and, and, and you know, heavy infrastructure and transport and logistics aviation. They're all looking to get insights from the data, make decisions based on that data and the insights they gain. Just seem to be a natural evolution for telcos because of the speed and the scale and so forth and the complexity. Um, 12 to 18 months down the track, I mean, what does this look like? I mean, the, the acquisition's taken place, you've got this match made in heaven. Seems to me that the, the relationship's just gone so smoothly. Um, is it fair to say that you're effectively now part of the DNA of that ecosystem and you'll slowly move up the stack? 
what are some of the use cases you think uh, are going to come along or even some of the use cases you're being asked to solve now? You, yeah. You've, you've had some interesting projects in the past and they've been very exciting, but as you've said, you know, the horizon's broadened for you. Yeah. Are there some example use cases you're working on with clients now uh, that, that you can share that, that are unique because of the relationship and sure. the acquisition or are there some that are coming along that you hadn't necessarily thought of before that are at that scale? I mean, that's such a, I know it's a big question. Yes, it's a lot of questions. But yes. there, you know, yeah. if you're thinking about the transition through that, you know, you've gotten into a, a much bigger family now and now you can do so many other things. Yeah. 12 to 18 months down the track, what are some of those big exciting new use cases that you can do with the predictive analytics based on that big platform, do you think? What are the, what are the problems that you haven't necessarily had a chance to solve before with Very this, good. I guess, environment? So there are a few things that are definitely different about you know, today's and tomorrow's network. Yeah, I, yeah. I used to work in a, in a knock. Okay. Um, and so, you know, our desire to let someone automate the processes around you know, repairing yeah, yeah. the network was very low. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So we really always wanted a person to sort of push the final button. Absolutely. The difference now is the, the scale and complexity is such that it's just not realistic and, and yeah. you're, you're not going to be able to um, cope uh, unless you have the yeah. automation. So now, you know, it's a necessity. It's not something you can decide not to do. It's almost like um, it's the role of reversal, isn't it? At exactly, first you didn't want yes. to trust the software because you, you knew you could trust the humans. Uh, and, and often people who just had a gut sense after 10 or 20 years of being in telco that yeah. it didn't look right or feel right, now it's hands off because the software is smarter and faster and leaner and right. that you could ever be at scale, right? Right, and so now we need that same level uh, of uh, intuition that you would get from a, an engineer in the NOC in the software. So right. that's where the right. predictive analytics right. piece comes in. And I think you know 5G network slicing is definitely an area mm -hmm. uh, that we're already starting to talk about. There's been a lot of discussions okay. happening here uh, this last few days already. Um, and then also, you know, as NFV scales, um, finding um, sort of moving the conversation up to the service layer, right, so right. Re recovery of the service, not just of the, the application or the yep, DNF. Yep. So I think, you know, those two things are definitely front of mind and definitely, you know, topics that we've already touched on in some of the conversations here so far this week. And is it fair to say, I mean, I get, I get the general sense from what you're saying here that uh, Ericsson will be its own first client and consuming this capability and that Cenex brings in. Um, but now you're almost kind of putting that at the dashboard level from the consumer so that enterprise and enterprise mobility consumers uh, that are powered by networks uh, implemented by Ericsson on behalf of some of the carriers and operators, they're almost going to be self-service. They're going to be consuming that as a service. That, that Cenex effectively becomes a service of predictive analytics for them to get better insights into their own products, their own services that they're consuming from carriers using Ericsson's infrastructure. Is that a fair thing to say? So I'd say there's, uh, there are probably two pieces of the Ericsson portfolio that work side by side. Right. So right. there's a, the expert analytics yep. uh, solution, uh, which is focusing more on the subscriber level, you know, customer experience right. uh, end of things. Um, and then, you know, that's a huge amount of data, as you know. It's uh, petabytes of it. And, and, and we would sit alongside that, looking okay. more at the sort of network service, if you like. So, you know, hand in hand, that's a really, really powerful story. Right. So right. I think, you know, that's definitely what you're going to see is the analytics uh, working towards the, the end customer, the consumer, okay. and then the, the network services that, that support all of that underneath. Um, so I think it's a, it, it is a natural fit, that's, that's for sure. Last question for you if I can, because okay. uh, I know I've kept you for a while. Um, we, we hear a lot about edge to edge, uh, edge computing, edge networking, edge analytics. Uh, what does that look like in the world of Cenex? Uh, you know, where are we at in your world, and particularly now with the Ericsson world, with regard to edge analytics and, and, and analytics of what's happening at the edge of the network devices, IoT, uh, uh, autonomous things, um, smart and dumb sensors. I mean, that, yeah. that's such an enormous world now. I mean, what does it even look like in your world with regard to what Cynix does? So something to, I think that we're, we're really conscious of it is cost. So right. um, anything in, in the IoT space is, is, is scale and it's low ARPU. Okay. Um, so the instant you insert an engineer into a problem, yep. um, you've just lost revenue for a significant right. period of time. A lot more yeah. zeros behind that cost, exactly. right? So I think th that really is another automation driver, right? So the only way IoT becomes a profitable market is to be able to have uh, a mechanism for uh, managing all of the communication between those right. devices and the applications that are supporting them. So we've already done some work with one customer where uh, we've been helping them manage all of their um, sort of enterprise transport networks, all of the okay. connectivity back to the data center, um, you know, in support of that IoT traffic. So we're, we're on the first steps toward that, I would mm -hmm, say, mm -hmm. but you can definitely see where that is going. And, and yeah. automation is the only way that that's going to really uh, 
be a benefit to the service provider and ultimately the end customer. Fantastic. Well, look, thanks so much for uh, sharing your time and giving Thank some you. of the insights into what you're up to and I guess uh, the acquisition journey and, and some of the exciting things we can look forward to in the next year or two, but also what you're doing right now. I mean, I think uh, you know, literally you're, you're deploying things right now that are making such a critical difference to the way people can implement services, self-healing networks, real-time analytics. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's not so much a brave new world, it's an exciting new world in my mind yeah. because it's, it's real, yeah. it's not science fiction, right? No, it's an interesting time for the industry. That's it is for indeed. Sure. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the acquisition and uh, I hear great things on the floor so far of what we've seen so far and I uh, look forward to what's happening in the next couple of years uh, as this grows and this uh, marriage uh, turns into another great success story yep. for yourselves and Ericsson and uh, I look forward to the next couple of days as we see uh, what yourself and the rest of the team are presenting on the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been fun. Thanks very much. Yeah. All right, folks, we'll wrap up there. I'm Des Blanchfield. We are here in New York in the uh, Ericsson 2018 uh, OSS BSS user group. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you in the next uh, video.